Did anyone notice the uh, connection between our gospel reading this morning and this weekend? Hi. Thank you. Our gospel reading this morning started at John chapter 3, verse 14, 3.14. Coincidence? I think not, right? Pie. Yesterday was Pie Day. For those of you that, that haven't followed it and have no kids in school or anything, that had to eat pie on 313 because 314 was a Saturday. But it's, it's Pie Day, and, right, and this Pie Day was even more grand because Pie is 3.14159265.3 are the first however many digits of Pie. So this year on Saturday, 314, year 15, at 926 and 53 seconds was a banner day for Pi Day. It's a once in a century kind of thing, so big whoop to do. But what does this have to do with our text this morning, right? Our text this morning starts at 314, and much like Pi, which is irrational and unending, God's grace is irrational and unending. And that's what we see this morning in our snippet that Luther calls the gospel in a nutshell. Right? God's love. Luther's statement of God's, of the gospel in a nutshell says that God is fundamentally a God of love and that love is the logic by which all of the kingdom of God is ruled and runs. God's love is what is ultimate. And it's that ultimate love that trumps everything in the end, even justice. God's love is what wins. So, today we get the most favorite verse of everybody in the world, right? How many times have you seen a poster for John 3.16? Almost every sporting event you go to, you see this poster held up of... John 3.16, because it's all about God's love, right? And if we really understood this verse, I don't think we would herald it and banner it and use it the way that we do. But for those of you that have heard me talk about this section of Scripture before, Carrie, you're not allowed to answer, what is my favorite verse out of John 3.14 through 21? You're not allowed to answer either. Why? Yes, that is correct. Why? My favorite verse, if you didn't hear what Greta had to say, is John 3.17, not John 3.16. John 3.16 is, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him may, may not perish but have eternal life. And John 3.17 is, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through Him. The reason that God sent His Son to die was not to condemn us, but to save us. And not just us, but the whole world. Right? God came to save. And yes, there is judgment that follows that. The judgment that follows is not punishment, though. It's simply the crisis that befalls those who do not believe or accept. They like the darkness too much that they don't want to come out into the light. Right? That's what Jesus says later. That, th- that they liked the darkness so much that they wouldn't come out of the darkness to see the light. It's a judgment as not as punishment, but it's judgment as crisis. It's judgment as tragedy. It's judgment as loss. You don't get to be with God. God comes in to love and redeem us. And God comes in with this love to redeem this loss and turn tragedy into victory, and demonstrate true power through sheer vulnerability and sacrifice. Sheer vulnerability and sacrifice by dying on the cross. And there brings the first problem with the most famous and beloved verse, John 3.16. Security comes through vulnerability and sacrifice. But what have you been told security comes through? Not vulnerability and sacrifice, but power and might, right? The only way you get ahead in the world is to use power and to overcome people 
to use what you have to get ahead in the world, right? We pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. How many of you have ever tried to put on a pair of boots? This analogy doesn't work quite as well in Wisconsin as it did in Texas. So, but try to put on a pair of boots without using the bootstraps. You know, those things that are on the side of the boots, they're meant to help you pull the boots on, right? So if you try to push your foot in a pair of cowboy boots without using the strap, it's not an easy thing to do, right? We have to pull ourselves up by those bootstraps. We're supposed to use our own power and our own understanding and our own might to get ourselves ahead in the world. And that's where security comes from. Making ourselves secure, having enough that we're going to get ahead, right? This isn't something that we would herald by wearing t-shirts that say power is might or having bumper stickers on our car or, or saying that those who use their power to get ahead are doing the right things if they're squashing those who are vulnerable. But it's the way that we live. If we're honest with ourselves, it's the way that we live. For we live in a world that seeks security not only through power, but also through wealth and consumption. And this is what, what we're taught, right? From a very early age, we're taught to avoid to be, avoid being vulnerable and avoid those who are truly vulnerable at all costs. It's not in our nature. It's not in our makeup. It's not in the way society tells us that we're supposed to be living. So, sacrifice. I'll sacrifice if I can afford to do it. Love our enemies? Maybe if everything else is taken care of first. And be vulnerable? Only if there's no other choice. It's what we're taught in society. You see, but the kind of self-sacrificing love that Jesus offers us on that cross to this world is frightening. No wonder we run and hide from Jesus when he wants us to do stuff for him. As this love requires us to trust nothing else other than God. We can't rely on our own power. We can't rely on anything else. We have to lay everything at the foot of the cross and trust only in a God who's willing to come and die for us. Right? And the only time that we ever get low enough to set our stuff at the foot of the cross is when we're brought there, when we're brought down low by illness or loss or broken relationships or disappointed hopes or some other way that the world has taught us that we're not going to get ahead. No matter how hard we try, no matter what we have achieved, no matter what position we've gotten to, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter at all. And when we get brought down so low, the only thing we can do is look up. And at that point, we realize and we know that only God can save us, that only God's love can do what we need to have happen in our lives. Only love can do that, and only God's love can do that. And it's frightening, frightening to be so utterly dependent upon another person. Once we reach the age that we can do things, we don't want to be dependent upon other people. Right, parents? I do it. I don't want your help. I can do it on my own. I don't need anybody else's help. Right? We're utterly dependent upon God, though. And the second part to this verse, which is scary and problematic, is that very sense right there, is that we can't do this on our own. And that the fact that God makes a claim on each and every one of our lives... Because God loved the world that He gave His only Son. Did He ask you if you wanted Him? Did He ask any of us if we wanted Jesus or not? God loved you more than you, than you could possibly know that He didn't care what you would think, whether or not He sent Jesus to die for you. He did it anyhow. He did it. Right? Right? Notice that God doesn't ask our permission before sending Jesus to die for us. Think of the claim that a person has on another person's life when they've saved that person's life. Especially if that person died in saving that other person's life. It's a claim that can't be simply overlooked. To, 
to get to the point of this story a little bit more, I, I have to tell a story told by David Lowe. He is now the president of Philadelphia Seminary. Um, he used to be a professor at Luther Seminary. But years ago, he preached a sermon about an off- the offensive nature of God's grace, suggesting that we might need to add four words to the end of our service of baptism, saying, Child of God, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, like it or not. <laughs> he continues his story by saying, A few weeks later, a friend shared a bedtime encounter he had had with his then six-year-old son. Upset that his father was putting him in bed early, earlier than he wanted to go, Benjamin said, Daddy, I hate you. Benjamin's father exercised the kind of parental wisdom I'd hoped for and replied, Ben, I'm sorry that you feel that way, but I love you. Benjamin's response to such a gracious word surprised his dad. Dad, don't say that. I'm sorry, Benjamin, but it's true. I love you. Don't, his son son protested. Don't say that again. At which point Ben's father remembered the words from the sermon that David had preached. He said, Benjamin, I love you. Like it or not. But why was Benjamin protesting his father's love? It's because Benjamin realized that he could not, under any circumstance, control whether or not his father loved him. He couldn't use his father's emotions or feelings and twist them to his own advantage. Right? In the face of such love, there's no bargaining, there's no control. If Benjamin's father had said that if he'd eaten all of his vegetables or if he would trade off another night of going to bed earlier, then Benjamin would actually have some control. He would exercise the measure of control over the situation and over his father. But his father said, you're going to bed and you can hate me, but I still love you. In the face of unconditional love, we're absolutely powerless. God so loved the world that He sent His only Son, not caring whether or not you wanted Him to. And He died so that you could have eternal life with God. It's unconditional and we're powerless. Okay, maybe we can choose to accept it or not. and Maybe we can run away from it. But we cannot influence it. We cannot manipulate it. And we cannot control it. God loves you like it or not. We are completely powerless in the face of this kind of love. And only when we've died to all of our delusions of actually being in any kind of control do we realize that such loss of perceived freedom and power is actually life. Let me say that again. Only when we've died to all of our delusions of actually being in control do we realize that such loss of perceived freedom and power is actually life. You see, God's love is audacious. It's irrational and it's unending. And God's God's love will continue to chase after us and hold on to us and redeem us all of the days of our lives whether we like it or not. He's going to chase you to the ends of the earth. You can run. You can try to hide. But He's still going to be there. And He's still going to love you. So maybe if we took this verse just a little bit more seriously, it might terrify us, reminding us that we are completely powerless in a world that teaches us constantly to always be accumulating, to always be exercising our power over others. But then again, if we actually look at it and understand it, maybe as we remember God's audacious, irrational, and unending love for us, we might actually realize that precisely because God's love is audacious, irrational, and unending, and always chasing after us, that this is the one relationship in our lives that we really don't have to worry about. Because we have absolutely no power over it. It's also the relationship in our lives that we can't possibly screw up. Because no matter what you do, God is still going to love you. Like it or not. God is still going to follow after you. Like it or not. Because God created this relationship 
God helps us to maintain this relationship and God will bring to it an end that is wonderful beyond all of your imaginations. If we can only remember to live in and through God's vulnerable, sacrificial, audacious, irrational, and unending love. So live your lives knowing that he went to that cross to die for you. Like it or not.